Hello, welcome to the Wildline Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Today is the weekend review show for October 25th to the 27th, 2019. Weekend 43 of the year, if you're counting. Uh, we have two new wide releases we're going to talk about this weekend. Uh, Countdown in Black and Blue. Kind of smaller genre releases, but we will do deeper dives on how they did. Uh, Joker's fourth weekend, Maleficent's second weekend. So we'll talk about that and the rest of the top ten. Uh, and then we also have some limited movies we're going to uh, talk about. Um, the Lighthouse, Parasite, Judy. Uh, this is the run-up to award season, so the they're starting to push these movies out to, to more theaters and see how they're going to do. Whether they sink or swim with mass audiences, most of them will sink. Um, also, we have a fantastic um, Time Machine segment from Chris. He talks about this weekend back in 2004. You had The Grudge out. You had Saw uh, it's a really great list. And he also talks about some newer movies that are coming out, uh, specifically the new Ghostbusters movie, which is coming out next year. So that's an awesome listen. Stay tuned for that. And then we'll close out the show talking about uh, the, uh, what's going to happen in the next few weeks at the box office. A couple of show notes or maybe box office notes in general, what's happening. Uh, one, my Twitter account got suspended, my original one. Uh, I don't really know why they sort of suspended it and then they said, hey, you broke some rule. What rule did you break? They don't tell you. Uh, I have not been able to get unfrozen. It's been frozen for like three weeks. So I'm assuming it's dead, uh, which kind of sucks. One, they never warned me. And two, there's no way to sort of overturn any sort of uh, suspension. So I'm going to keep trying to get that one uh, unfrozen, but it's probably not going to happen. So I started another one. I don't give a shit, whatever. Uh, I almost had like a thousand followers, which is a big milestone for me. And then they like froze it and suspended me like right then. I was like at 989. Uh, but I'll get back to a thousand here pretty soon. So I got a new uh, Twitter account. So definitely just search that and it'll pop up Wildline Podcast on Twitter. Uh, another bigger sort of news that happened within the box office world is that Box Office Mojo, which has really been the go to website for box office nerds for like the last, I don't know, like 15 years, I want to say, uh, has gone through this massive redesign and they've paywalled a lot of it. And so the backstory in this is that uh, Box Office Mojo is sort of owned by IMDb, Internet Movie Database. That's been around forever. Every movie nerd knows IMDb. Uh, it basically lists out all the credits, who does what movies, who's in what. It's just an, a fantastic website. That went to IMDb Pro. I think Amazon bought them is what happened. They put that uh, a lot of information behind the paywall. It kind of made sense because they added a lot more information about studios and who was involved with stuff and like phone numbers. There's like studio phone numbers on there and like agent phone numbers. Now uh, I'm trying out the uh, IMDb pro because they've also done the same thing where box office mojo. Now this happened like a few days ago. A, a lot of people are upset. Uh, it's a h- huge, massive change for the website. It looks a little bit better, but the data seems to be a lot of it seems to be missing and all these like really interesting, cool records are just gone um, so everybody's kind of in panic mode in the box office nerd world. We don't really know what to do because we've relied so much on box office mojo. Uh, I'm going to try the pro out and see, uh, if the stuff behind the paywall is worth paying for. It's like 150 bucks a month or a year for IMD pro. So I'm going to try that out. Uh, there's also alternatives. Like, so if you always went to box office mojo, like what am I supposed to do now? There's still numbers there. Like they have basic stuff here, but like even for the weekend, this October, um, the 25th through 7th page, they're missing like the drops for what they did this weekend versus last. So it might just take a really long time for them to get back up to speed. It's a weird change. I kind of understand it for maybe from a business perspective. It always felt like box office mojo was like this gift from heaven uh, for us nerds. It's like who reads this and who's upkeeping this? Who's paying for all of this? It kind of felt too good to be true. Um, but there's also alternatives like the numbers is a fantastic website. It's a little bit different, a little more old school look to it, but it's got good numbers. I'm going to be using that mostly during the show. Uh, the numbers, it's just the numbers or the dash numbers, uh, dot com. Uh, there's always a really good website. They have fantastic numbers on genre and keyword. Um, so they've been, they've been around forever too. So definitely use that as an alternative. Box Office Mojo right now is okay. Like it's usable to some degree. Like I can get like basic information, but a lot of the sort of nuance and stuff that we talk about, it's missing. So I'm kind of, there's no per theater averages now that I'm looking. I'm looking at the chart right now. Like that's how I do my show. I go down and read all this information and kind of comment on it. And as I go, uh, it's not there anymore. So I'm going to have to start looking for other sources. That's okay. It's life. Uh, the numbers is a good alternative for right now. And if Box Office Mojo never gets their stuff back together, that's okay. I'm sure someone else will come along and build a cool website for Box Office uh, data. Just because there's a lot of people that are into it. 
Um, and the people that are into it are super passionate. So I'm sure someone's going to build an alternative to Box Office Mojo. Okay, that's our sort of bigger news. Let's get into the top 10 this weekend. Number one was Joker uh, from Warner Brothers, obviously. $18.9 million for this weekend. A phenomenal 35% uh, drop. Uh, also in the news, it is the number one rated R movie of all time. I think worldwide, that is. That's worldwide. Uh, it's just, it's doing phenomenal. It's it's doing way better than like, I thought that it was going to do very, very well. It's at $849 million right now uh, worldwide. Uh, it beat Deadpool this weekend. And Ryan Reynolds put this hilarious tweet up about it. Um, congratulating Joker for being the new, uh, the biggest rated R film of all time worldwide. Um it's not that surprising to me that it's doing very, very well. It is surprising to me that it, it's doing this level to the degree of the success that it's having right now is, is outrageous. Um, the fact that it, it's going to flirt with maybe a billion dollars worldwide for a very dark, um, non-family friendly comic book movie uh, that has more probably in common with Taxi Driver than it does Captain America uh, is kind of it's bizarre. Um, and it's really fascinating that it's done so well. And I think, you know, the lessons that you can take away from this, especially inside the industry and like what works and what doesn't work, um, you know, it had a lot of things going for it and also had a lot of things going against it. DCEU is very up and down. You know, you had the Justice League, uh, Zack Snyder era that was just, let's be honest, it wasn't very good. Um, Batman versus Superman, I always state this is probably one of the worst box office movies or, you know, popcorn box office movies I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it's just atrocious. Um, the Superman movie is terrible. Justice League is ba- basically unwatchable. So they are in a tough spot and they sort of turned it around with Wonder Woman and Aquaman, which both did very well. But both of those movies were, you know, they weren't exactly pushing the envelope cinematically. Joker's different. Joker's almost like an art film that's also a comic book movie at the same time. And so DCEU is going to have a really interesting, or Wonder Brothers is going to have a really interesting choice here. Like, do we go the Wonder Woman? sort of, you know, I want to say a little bit middle of the road, family friendly comic book movie origin story stuff, or do we go the Joker route? And I think you're just going to have to have two sort of separate DC um, universes, essentially going to have the sort of the adult fair like Joker and the family stuff like Aquaman and Wonder Woman. Um, but why this is, it's fascinating to me for a couple of reasons. This feels much more in line, or I relate this back to more Logan than anything, which was a very adult drama film sort of cloaked in a comic book movie sort of skin. And that's what this is. This is like a, you know, 70s NYC Scorsese film. Like, it's very edgy. Uh, has nothing to do with other sort of comic book movies, but it does kind of feel close to Logan, where it's a little bit more realistic, a little bit more authentic about actual human emotion. And so normal comic book movies, they can be a little bit more like fantasy um, there's not, people don't have like mental illness in a normal comic book movie like the, the Joker has in this one. So, uh, it's just, I think it's very different. It's a really interesting win for Warner Brothers. And I think, you know, more than anything, it's going to take the comic book movie genre in a totally different direction that I didn't see. I did a whole, like, uh, whenever it was, whenever Logan came out, uh, Wonder Woman, I talked a lot about where the genre of comic book movies was going. You know, there's basically been like four, essentially like like maybe five waves now maybe joker is the fifth wave i sort of counted the fourth wave as um the logan wonder woman sort of um difference from like in deadpool as well shifting away maybe from the avengers grandiose films now obviously the avengers films did fantastic the last two years but they did feel like that was ending that third wave and the fourth wave kind of felt like the more parody the deadpool the more serious logan uh, and this, I don't know, did we fit this in the fourth wave? Maybe it's that con- direct connection to Logan and being more serious, but I almost kind of feel like it's a fifth wave of comic book movies where it's almost like comic book movies are, are are trying to be, I don't know if experimental is the right word, they're trying to be more in harmony with the discourse of film in, in and of itself. That is, they're not their own thing. They're part of this long tradition of American filmmaking where you have characters like the Joker who are mentally ill and violent, and there's not really a lot of silver lining going on here. There's not like everybody's okay at the end of the day. Like they're sort of, you know, they're becoming more, um, I guess the term is like more in harmony 
with what other filmmakers have done throughout the last few decades as opposed to trying to do in their own thing. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, they're becoming more fluent in the, the language of American filmmaking, uh, which I think is fascinating because I did not see this coming at all. I thought it was just kind of like kind of like do the Wonder Woman thing. Maybe we'll get like a Logan type movie every couple of years and then it maybe slowly fades into something else. Um, but if we have movies like the Joker, it just reinvigorates the entire genre. Now think of all the different cool movies you could do like the Joker with any villain from any comic book series. Um, it's going to be awesome. And, you know, kind of like maybe the Watchmen on HBO kind of fits into this, like a very sort of grim, uh, almost morose and gritty version, uh, of a comic Watchmen sort of lends itself to that, the source material. But it's kind of cool. You know, I think Joker is um, I, I do feel like it's something brand new for the genre that it's going to, you know, reinvigorate the whole thing and get us a lot more cool movies like this coming up. But the performance is like basically the Grand Slam of the year. Uh, you know, eight hundred fifty billion dollars worldwide. It's just phenomenal. It's fantastic. Um, but that was number one, obviously. Number two was Maleficent, Mystery of Evil, Mystery of Evil, Mistress of Evil, uh, eighteen point five million just lost out to Joker. Uh, negative uh, drop 50%, which is not great. Um, per theater average this weekend was about 4,900. Very even with Joker. Uh, total gross so far is $65 million for Maleficent, Mystery of Evil, uh, Mistress of Evil. I'm going to keep getting that wrong forever. Um, it, this performance not good. It's not good at all. Uh, $65 million. I think that's like what the original opened at. Uh, so it's two weeks in, two weekends in, too. It's in trouble. It's not going to do well. Uh, maybe they'll toss it on Disney Plus. But like I said last weekend, the economics of subscription video on demand are totally different than traditional home entertainment. Like you would have a whole sort of release window cycle where you knew where that money was going to come from. You know, in three in three months, they would get their VOD or it's called TVOD, transactional video on demand, which would be your pay per view essentially. And you get that money for the movie. That's fine. That's still probably going to be in place here. But then licensing it out to cable stations, to Netflix, that's all gone, right, for them. Because they're just going to put this on Disney+. Plus, and now it's going to drive subscriptions and stuff like that. But the economics of that are, are, are cloudy at best about how that money's going to come back. So it's kind of an interesting movie. They needed this thing to do, I think, a lot better. It's, it's going to lose money, possibly. Um, you know, let's see, worldwide, I'm not sure where it's at right now. But it, it it's kind of stretching... Uh, its ability to sort of break even here, I think. It's at 293 worldwide, so that's pretty good international, 220, uh, 28 international. Um, but, uh, you know, 293 right now is just not where you want this thing to be. Uh, break even on this thing, I have no idea. I think the, the production budget was like 170 or something or higher than that, maybe 180. Uh, so it's got to make a lot of cash. It's only like $500 million to break even. I just don't think it's going to happen. I'm sure Disney will just write it off as like a marketing cost for Disney Plus when it premieres on there. It would be really fascinating if they said, you know, screw your pay-per-view, which is 90 days after a movie premieres in the theater, almost always goes to pay-per-view, uh, transactional VOD, VOD, whatever you want to call it. You pay five, you know, five bucks to rent the movie, six bucks. What if they said, screw it? What if they also said, screw it? We're not going to sell a digital copy either. We're just going to put this thing on Disney Plus three weeks, three months after. It would be, be really fascinating. I mean, they're kind of screwing themselves over, but like, I think they're going to start playing with stuff like that now where the release window is going to be totally different uh, with these new streaming services coming out, but we'll see how that plays out. Okay, so that was number two. Number three was The Adamus Family. Um, this is from UAR, United Artists Releasing, which is MGM and Annapurna, technically. Uh, $11.7 million this weekend. 28% drop, very good. I guess it's the Halloween season, right? So families want to go see a Halloween movie. Um, per theater average is 27, 2800. So far, $72 million. That is a big win for this movie because I I don't think anybody expected much out of it, uh, but it's kind of like gone, gone above and beyond um, expectations here. To Like it's going to do $100 million domestically. If you asked me that, like, I don't know, um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, right before it came out, I would have said like maybe 50 million tops, 40 million would be a good run. Uh, the fact that it's going to do uh, $100 million in Mexico alone it, it is really surprising. I think it's one of the bigger surprises this year that there's still people that want to see the Adams Family stuff. What is that about? Uh, only 80, only $11 million, uh international so far, but I'm sure it has not opened a lot of places. So $84 million worldwide on that one. Very good performance. Very surprising performance. Uh, number four was Zombieland Double Tap. This one is, um, you know, had an okay. I thought it was a really good opening weekend last weekend. 
um but it's not doing so well right now dropped 57 percent. the reason that concerns me is that it's kind of in line with horror films um the problem there is that um we're in halloween season halloween's on thursday so this shouldn't be dropping 57 percent during this season it should be dropping like 40 percent 45 percent uh so this one's at 47 million dollars so far worldwide's at 63 uh, it's going to make money, but it's not going to be nearly the the bigger hit that I thought it was going to be. Uh, it's kind of tapering off here a bit. It's just very surprising. I, I think that the reception to it maybe was not as fantastic as the first group of fans who saw it. Um, but we'll see how it does this week with Halloween. Maybe it makes up a lot during the week is possible. Who knows? Um, but that was number four. Number uh, five, uh, we have a new movie, uh, Countdown. This came in a little bit higher than... What it was looking like on Thursday. So this is an STX movie. Um, STX is one of the newer studios the last four or five years. Or maybe six years. Uh, maybe nine years. Who knows? Um, last decade at least. Um, so they distributed it. It's the Boys Schiller Film Group. was the, Produced it. Very small. Um, uh, $6.5 million production budget. This is a throwaway genre horror film for Halloween. It's a, ca- a cash grab. I told people not to go see it because it's terrible. Critics gave it a 27% around tomatoes, a 43. And nobody reviewed it. It's like 10 people reviewed this. 27% from top critics. Ouch. 31 out of 100 actual score. Verified audience was okay. 70% fresh. Uh, 76 actual score. That's from verified. Uh, all audience was 64% fresh. Um, 70 actual score, a little bit lower. Uh, cinema score is a C plus, but you got to give it sort of the whore bump about about half a grade so more like a b minus still not good uh post track was a 60 percent ouch uh letterbox was a 44 out of 100 obviously the film twitter people hate this i hate it uh happy death did you got a 60 escape room got a 56 prodigy um the prodigy got a 52 so it's kind of below all those people hate this movie i mean i could tell you from the trailer that like it's just not well done like it's not a it's a it's a very it's an interesting concept that they stretch to 90 minutes now, an interesting concept was Escape Room, uh, which came out this January, did very well. Also from Sony, uh, from, actually that was from Sony Gems, this is SDX. The other movie we're going to talk about is from Sony Gems. Um, you know, that was a kind of like a, you know, very basic concept. Hey, the Escape Room games, aren't those fun? Everybody's doing it. Let's make a horror movie. You know, simple premise. But they did they did a good job with it. It was really kind of fascinating where they went with it. Uh, I can tell you right now, this one, I haven't seen it yet, but I know it's I know it's terrible. I know it's just like, oh, it's an app that tells you when you die. That's it. That's probably it. That's probably the entire concept of the film. That's 90. It's probably like 85 minutes, too. Um, I mean, audiences don't like it. Um, The biggest thing is the C plus cinema score is bad. The post track of 60 is a real uh, sort of sign that it's not doing well with audiences. And that 70 percent verified audience score is really low. Uh, So this one is not going to stick around, despite the fact that it's Halloween. No one's going to want to go see this after like next weekend. So but. That being said, $9 million uh, is not bad on a $6.5 million budget. At most, it'll do probably $25 million domestically. Uh, I don't know if there's much market for this movie outside uh, the U.S. and Canada. Um, but it's an okay performance. It's, you know, it didn't break out, which I thought there was a possibility it would do like $20 million this weekend. That didn't happen. But it certainly didn't flop either. Like flop would be like a four or a three million dollar opening for this, and that didn't happen. So this is a win for SDX. They need a lot of wins. Um, you know, every once in a while you just, you know, you put zero effort into a movie, <laughs> a genre flick like this, and just throw it out there, six point five million production, and it's gonna make you some cash, and that's what's gonna happen in countdown. Uh number six was another new movie, Black and Blue. This is a cop drama, a gritty cop drama. Um uh from Sony Gems did eight point three million dollars this weekend. Uh, a four thousand dollar per theater average, which was higher than Countdown. So Black and Blue was only in about two thousand theaters. Uh, Countdown was in twenty six hundred theaters, so it actually had about a seven hundred dollar more per theater average. Uh, Black and Blue did over Countdown, but ended up below it because it wasn't in enough theaters. Um, so let's talk about this one. Kind of a similar genre flick situation. Uh, Sony Screen Gems loves uh, these genre flicks. Forty six percent from critics. Uh, 54 actual score out of 100. Top critics was a little bit less. 44% score, uh, 55 actual score. Uh, verified audience was a 92%, though. One of those one of those discrepancies we're seeing over and over again where critics hate something, audiences that show up to see it and actually buy a ticket love it. 
a 91 actual score. All audience was a little bit lower, 86%, 86 actual score. No cinema score on this. Uh, my guess is that it just wasn't in enough theaters uh, for them to do it. Cinema score can be a little bit weird with that. Like they only do it in like maybe what, 12 theaters, seven theaters, they only do it one showing. So if it's not in like 3000 theaters, it's tough for them to do. Uh, Post track was high at 80%. Uh, Letterbox was not gonna be high on this. It's not really a Letterbox movie, 58 out of 100. Uh, Intruder, which is the same director, also Screen Gems, I believe, uh, got a 46. Searching, also from Screen uh, Screen Gems, got a 76. Really high for Letterboxd. That's a good movie. Uh, John Chu's in that. Uh, Proud Mary, um, also from Screen Gems, only got a 42. So it's kind of in the middle there. Uh, not a great performance with that group of people. So critics don't like it. Uh, film snobs don't like it. Uh, film nerds. Uh, but the audience who went to go see it uh, loved it. Um and so who did go see it? That's a good question. So 47% African-American. So a normal movie, normal moving going audience average is only about 12% African-American. So they definitely targeted that demographic very well and they showed up. Um, white people at 28%, normally that are 53%. Uh, Latino at 16%, normally at like low 20s, 23-ish. Uh, Asian other was at 9%. That's kind of in line with the normal audience. So the African-American um, demographic definitely showed up for this. Definitely bought tickets and loved it with that verified audience score of 92 percent uh female was 52 percent versus male 48 percent that's definitely over indexed on a female audience versus an average uh, movie going audience um and black and blue played uh this is from deadline uh played best on the east and south um deadline also has a note about both of these movies uh, i'll just read exactly what they said uh while universal and blumhouse will spend to open their low budget fair around $44 million for a fresh IP. Rivals such as Orion, Screen Gems, and STX typically spend the least amount of the prints and advertising a budget possible to hit a 10 million plus final domestic so their ancillary deals can kick in. Let me translate that. So there's other sort of lower budget studios, Blumhouse being probably the most famous and successful right now, where if something like Get Out or Up comes out, they're gonna spend about 50, you know, 45, 50 million dollars just in the marketing budget worldwide. But these other studios um, like Sony Screen Gems and SDX are like, we don't care just as long as it makes over $10 million domestically total. And both of these will easily do that. Uh, they're more, they're, they care more about the streaming deals, the TV deals uh, and the VOD stuff, the transaction of VOD pay-per-view uh, than they do uh, how it's going to do with the box office. Like it's almost like a kind of like contra contractual obligation to put it out in the, uh, a movie theater and just the real money's going to come later. So that's probably what's going on with both these movies. Um, uh, age wise for black and blue, 75% was over 25. That's definitely over indexed on older folks. Countdown was the opposite. 76% um, was under 35 higher with the, the younger folks. Um, males over 25 or 29% of the countdown audience uh, females under 25 or 27%. Um, 13 to 17 year olds, over 15% of the crowd, uh, gave it the best rating. It's on post track of 82%. So the young people liked Countdown, the old people like Black and Blue. Uh, so those are two, you know, not big wide releases at all, but like kind of interesting. Kind of the the bread and butter of exhibition business is sort of stuff like this. Uh, they're not going to make a hundred million dollars domestically, uh, but they're gonna they're gonna make a profit for both their studios, and it's kind of the name of the game. Uh, so that was five and six. Let's talk about number seven, Gemini Man uh, from Paramount Pictures. Four million dollars, 52% drop, and it's third weekend. Uh, I can't remember what the deadline was saying on this one, or maybe it was Variety. Some exclusive. It's going to lose $75 million. So when we talk about this stuff, it's like that's the end of the road for a flop like Gemini Man. It's going to lose, you know, I think that's probably being generous. It's probably going to lose more like $100 million. Um, and so that's what happens. You, you bet wrong. You spend $200 making a movie like this. Uh, you're gonna lose a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's just like compare that to the the swing of like this doing well. A movie that does very well, top twenty of the year, is gonna make two hundred million dollars in profit. So you talk about the swing there. That's three hundred million dollars lost at the end of the day. You know, going from this revenue and profit, all of this hundred million dollar loss. Uh, so it's not a good performance. Ang Lee, he's just got to choose a different path. And like, what is Will Smith thinking? Trying to be an action star. Ang Lee, I just please go back to like small arty films that are just super stoic and slow and glacial uh, and I will love them and eat them up. And so will all the film nerds and 
snobs out there uh don't try and make these big movies because you they're not good at it uh i think that's kind of the moral of the story with gemini man and no one's going to give him a huge bang it's kind of like um maybe like m night Shyamalan and the fact that like he's an, a really good filmmaker but like needs someone to sort of rein him in a lot uh and m night Shyamalan's had you know he's having a comeback now although glass and he may have blown his comeback with glass which i thought was fun but like people got like really up in arms about it not being great. I was like, this is M Night Shyamalan. Like you know what you get when you're going in here. It's gonna be a blast. It's gonna be over the top. Um, but it's not gonna be like high art. So like whatever. His unbreakable days are over. Uh, I think Ang Lee just it was a mistake for Paramount to even greenlight this. The script was from the '90s. It just doesn't it doesn't make sense to make this movie. Uh, number eight was The Lighthouse from A24. Uh, now this is a film Twitter movie if I've ever seen one. People are like obsessed with it, me included. Um, so this is a wide ex- uh, expansion here to 586 theaters, which I think is a feels like a big bet to me. Uh, did three point or sorry uh, about 3.1 million this weekend. But what's most important is the per theater average was 5,261 dollars. That's okay. Um, I don't think anybody expects this to make a lot of money. Uh, it's definitely an art film meant for a specific type of audience who's into arty films. And, you know, it'll play well in New York and Los Angeles, Chicago, all the big cities downtown will play at the art theater. Uh, it's actually playing at my local theater out in the suburbs of uh, St. Louis. Uh, so I might go see it here eventually. Um, is this performance good, bad? Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, it's all about expectations for a movie like this. This is not a traditional Hey, if this makes $40 million, it'll be great. Or 50, that's not going to happen. Uh, it's too weird of a movie. A24 knows that. Um, but this is an awards film. So they're, the, what they're trying to do is create enough buzz where with inside, inside the industry, they can't ignore this film. They can't ignore the performances in it. Uh, and so they want to get a best director, best actor, best film possibly for this. I don't see that happening. I think actor awards are possible. Uh, but that's the goal with A24 here is to, to get some awards um, hype going for it. Uh, but Lighthouse, you know, is going to expand more? What's the strategy here? Honestly, I wouldn't. What's the point? Like, if your goal is to win awards, just keep playing it in, like, art house theaters throughout the country, like a roadshow model. I think um, Kevin Smith's doing that with the new Jane Silent Bob movie. It's like like a literal roadshow. Like, it's going to play, like, one city each weekend, and it's going to keep taking it through the country. Like, that's how they used to open movies back in, like, the 70s. Uh, before uh you don't need to do that with lighthouse but you know keep it pretty low you know push it out to more than a thousand theaters seems pretty risky to me i would let it simmer at the the 500 theaters you have now for a couple of weeks and then see where it goes uh the current war director's cut does anybody understand what the hell this movie's about like 101 studios which is a new studio did 2.7 open a thousand theaters 2600 which is terrible for an opening weekend uh, I guess it's like Thomas Edison, Vanessa Cumberbatch. I don't know what's going on with that. It's a very bizarre film. Um, it, the releasing strategy doesn't make sense. It, what are they trying to do? It seems like a straight to streaming type movie. Uh, so that predictably totally flopped on wide release. Uh, number ten was Abominable. Uh, Two million dollars, forty three percent drop. Um, below a thousand dollars per theater. That's not good. That really petered out. Like fifty seven million dollars. You know, it was Abominable versus Adam's Family. I put all my money on Abominable. You know, kind of a cute story from Universal. Um, you know, it's got the international play to it as well. Let's see how it's doing worldwide. It must be doing pretty well, I would hope. And it's okay. $87 million international worldwide is at 144. That's way too low for a movie like this. Uh, that it, it kind of feels like a flop territory. Not even under performance. It kind of feels like a flop. Uh, it probably would cost like $70 million to make. Um, not a great performance at all, but for that one. Uh, so that's the top 10 before we, uh, uh, throw it over to Chris and the time machine. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some limited stuff. That's, that's still out there. Parasite, uh, from neon. This one's got just like the buzz on this is just, it's supernova. Uh, 1.8 million. I think they're doing it right too. Still only in 129 theaters. It's been out for three weeks. I love that. I love that they're doing that. They're just like, Oh, you want this? You're not going to get it. You know, unless you live in like a big city, we're not going to roll it out to you for like two weeks. Uh, the very exclusivity it matters. Uh, so it's at 129 theaters, still doing fourteen thousand dollars per theater in 129 theaters. And that's that's great. Uh, it's at four point one million so far. Um, I, I, I like what Neon's doing with. I, I really like Neon a lot. They're um, an offshoot of Alma Draft House out of Austin. You know, food in uh, movie theaters. They kind of invented that. 
uh, and I believe their founder uh, helped found Neon. Uh, I love the studio. It's really interesting what they're doing. And they kind of like, I love that they go back and forth with A24, those two like art house like darlings right now. Uh, but they're doing a really good job with Neon. Uh, another kind of art house darling to some degree is Fox Searchlight. They have Jojo Rabbit out. Uh, that one's only in 55 theaters, did $18,000, $19,000 per theater, which is pretty good. It sits at $1.5 million so far. Um, that I feel like the buzz on that has just faded a bit. There was a lot like the week it came out. I remember I was in Ikea and a guy had a Jojo Rabbit shirt on. And I was like, oh man, this is the moment, huh? When it's coming out. Uh, but it's just a week later, it just, it just doesn't feel like Parasite. And I think the Lighthouse are kind of sucking up. There's only so much film snob, film Twitter hype you can get. And I feel like Parasite and Lighthouse are getting that. And that will translate into awards. Like it just will. Um, so it's kind of eh, not doing so well. Uh, not listed here on the numbers website is the uh, Jesus. Uh, what the hell is it? The new Kanye thing. Um, Jesus something. Uh, Jesus is King on IMAX. That did 800K uh, this weekend. You know, whatever. He's, I don't know what he's charging. It's like 40 minutes long. But it did okay. I mean, for what it was. Um, Warner Brothers put out Western Stars, which is a Buffalo... Um, Buffalo Bruce Springsteen uh, concert movie, uh, not doing very well. One thousand dollars per theater and five hundred theaters. Um, I think that's mostly it. Anything else? Oh, James, not Bob. We talked about that a little bit. Uh, that's doing okay. I, you know, I think I overplayed the the road show. That it's in seventeen theaters. Uh, it's doing thirteen k per theater, which is pretty good. Um, much better than I think that they did wide. Uh, I think that's mostly it for limited releases like it is oh no uh yeah i guess that's it so in any event let's uh turn it over to chris with the time machine hey all this is the wild line time machine my name's chris thanks dan for having me back for another edition of looking back to the past of the american box office as well as into the future uh what i got for you guys this week and i have the year of 2004 uh, the weekend of October 27th, and yeah, it's uh, a year in which you actually had studios trying to put out big horror movies for the annual Halloween tradition, uh, unlike this year where it's kind of just trashy schlock, um, like Countdown or family-friendly stuff like Adam's Family, which just looks awful, like, I, it's so ugly, um, but uh, I guess it's a hit, so whatever, um, I didn't like any of the movies really that came out in 2004 around this weekend either, but at least it felt like Hollywood was trying, which uh, I can at least respect. Uh, so they were on the big wave of J-horror remakes, right? 2002 saw The Ring, um, 2004 saw The Grudge, and that took the top spot this weekend back in 2004, 15 years ago. Sony Pictures uh, retaining the top spot for a second week in a row. Uh, Kind of big drop of 44%, uh, taking 21 mil that weekend. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's still a top spot. You had two other wide releases, and they didn't quite crack that. And you had uh, a, a Grudge 2, a Grudge 3, which I don't even remember the third one. Um, and this kind of uh, iconic, you know, girl with long hair, kind of like The Ring. It always confused me that there was like that such a distinct similarity between those two J horror movies, um, but I, it seemed like this one uh, didn't have quite as much cachet as The Ring, but it still uh, kind of bled into pop culture references, lampooned in several parody films, including ones probably produced by the Wayans brothers. But this one, uh, you know, kind of fizzled out pretty distinctly, even more than The Ring. I'd say seventy mil for the sequel in two thousand six, uh, thirty eight mil for the sequel in two thousand nine. Um, the Grudge, though, is probably going to stick around in the public consciousness for a while. It made 110 mil, which is huge. And obviously the PG-13 rating helped a lot, but still like this is a horror film. Horror films other than like it in the past uh, few years never break 100 mil. Um, but this seemed to be kind of expected uh, in the early 2000s to mid 2000s that whatever big horror movie the studios were pushing that, uh, Halloween that was going to make big money, especially if it was not rated R. So uh, Takashi Shimizu, the director of this film, also did the original from Japan 
uh, entitled Juan. And uh, interestingly, he made the sequel of Grudge 2, but he stayed away from Grudge 3. Uh, literally, Grudge and Grudge 2 are still, to date, the only American films that he has made. He's otherwise stayed in Japan uh, producing for uh, classic J-horror. I think, perhaps, it seemed like uh, some of like the negative attention that uh, the grudge got, kind of like the neutered, sterile version of J-horror. Uh, perhaps made him think like, yeah, I'm, you know, the money's nice, but I'm good now. And he's back to doing some of the more classic and interesting stuff in Japan. Uh, but who knows? Uh, Sarah Michelle Geller was also uh, taking the lead, of course, a lot of whitewashing going on uh, with these J-horror remakes. Uh, and they thought they needed to do it. I don't know if they necessarily did, because I think uh, Sarah Michelle Geller and Bill Pullman are like the only... Uh, non-Asian actors in even the remake of The Grudge. So to kind of put that little twist on it for American audiences uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense in retrospect. It, it, it almost seems offensive. Like this is <laughs> Sarah Michelle Gellar. She was never really a box office phenom. Like she helped make 153 mil for Scooby-Doo, but you know, that was pretty much the iconography of Scooby-Doo. Probably didn't need her either. And yet the familiar faces, of course, especially of like teen or young adult stars was pretty much the norm in that era. Number two that weekend was Ray, the Ray Charles biopic starring Jamie Foxx, directed by Taylor Hackford. Uh, and that was its debut weekend with uh, 20 mil, which is kind of huge, uh, actually, for a biopic. I mean, Dan's been talking about Judy. And of course, that movie is kind of uh, with his platform releasing doing a strategy that works well for it. But can you imagine, like, I think Rocket Man did well. Maybe it's the musical biopic uh, that does it. But, uh, of course, Bohemian Rhapsody, too. But uh, this is something that seems to happen. Uh, maybe I'm I'm just spitballing here, but is it part of the sexism of the industry? Like, uh, it seems like female biopics never do quite as well as male biopics. And so it'll be interesting to see when Aretha comes out next year. I don't know. Uh, yes, I made 20 mil that weekend uh, and ended up uh, going on to make um, 75 mil total. It was the number 35 film of 2004 at the end of the year. And of course, the box office uh, was largely indebted to, I would argue, Jamie Foxx, as well as the uh, kind of buzz for the Oscars. But I, I detested this film. I did not think there was much of anything interesting about it. And what it ended up having to say about Ray Charles uh, just made me like him less. So I wasn't really astounded by the music or anything like that. It was pretty by the numbers. You know, Taylor Hackford is an interesting director. He has made some of these kind of very straightforward films. Like Ray, he made a very generic action movie as well in 2000 called Proof of Life that came after Ray, only made 62 mil. Well, not, that's still not a horrible take for, for you know, a kind of by the numbers action film but like this guy also made one of my favorite movies of the 90s the absolutely absurd the devil's advocate in 97 which made 153 million dollars i don't remember it being that big of a hit but apparently it was um al pacino chewed the hell out of the scenery in that movie uh pun intended and yet now this is a guy that has fallen completely off the face of the earth kind of like takashi shimitsu but he still seems at least you know competent and uh prolific in japan uh and taylor hackford is definitely prolific but he, i don't know if he's confident competent anymore um his last movie to come out was 2016 it was called the comedian with robert de niro uh and it only made 1.7 million i don't even remember this movie coming out but it's it was technically a, a studio picture i don't know if it was wide released uh i couldn't find a lot of info on that but it it seemingly just like tanked this guy's career um who knows we'll see uh number three for that weekend was it probably arguably even more famous in retrospect uh compared to ray and the grudge this was the premiere weekend of saw the original james wan film that started it all from Lionsgate. gate uh, it made 18 mil its opening weekend number three spot and it went on to make crazy amount of money through franchising uh 976 million now uh franchise total for the saw series which is insane guys that's like le yeah a little less than a billion and i know we talk about billions now in terms of marvel and stuff like that but like still for a original franchise that was you know 
started with a Carrie Elway's like screaming for his wife to try to figure out whether or not he should cut his leg off or arm off. I don't know whatever he was handcuffed to in that grimy bathroom. This was a weird thing because unlike most franchises that get diminishing returns, of course, Saw just grew and grew in popularity. You had 147 mil for Saw 2 in 05, 164 for Saw 3 in 06, and then it b- bumps down a little bit, but still only uh, a little bit. 139 mil for Saw 3 in uh, Saw 4 in 07, I mean. Uh, 103, still 103 mil for Jigsaw in 2017 when it's like on life support. And of course, we know now that Chris Rock is uh, rebooting it, and who knows what'll happen with that but uh it it seems like i don't know maybe i'm singing a different tune i think i mentioned way back a few months ago about uh, the saw reboot and i was skeptical at best but maybe it's a pretty solid uh gamble uh for chris rock maybe he's doing a smart thing anyways i also want to mention that james wan has had a crazy career as well like he did saw and saw two and then he passed it on and he went on to make two of the other like biggest horror movies of the new millennium uh you had insidious in 2010 uh, making 319 mil not counting franchising and the conjuring in 2013 uh sorry 97 mil for insidious 319 mil for the conjuring in 2013 so this guy has just been going up from there and now he's making action movies superhero movies aquaman it's insane uh and this was a movie starring carrie elways a guy that like only People know because he is uh, Prince Wesley in The Princess Bride. That movie, by the way, only made 30 mil back in 87. And other than that, like Carrie Elway's biggest hit is Twister, in which he played like a cartoon villain, uh, 494 million. Uh, I think Carrie Elway's is on the upswing, though, because not only was he in the latest season of Stranger Things, he's also in the upcoming Black Christmas remake. And he's so he's kind of coming back to his, you know, horror uh, zenith. Uh, So that'll be interesting. Uh, Good luck to him. Uh, Let's look at the future. I've got three movies that uh, just recently wrapped filming, or no, sorry, two movies that wrapped filming uh, this week, and one movie that uh, got a release date. Um, Let's start with the movies that wrapped filming. Uh, So first, we got to talk about this. This is a big deal uh, that a week ago, the 2020 version of Ghostbusters wrapped filming. Jason Reitman's attempt at uh, kind of correcting what many people do perceived to be the wrongs of the 2016 uh, film, which has since been uh, subtitled Answer the Call with, uh, you know, um, Kate McKinnon and Leslie Jones. And, you know, I know Dan does not like that movie. He thinks it's bad. He's not part of like the um, Reddit 4chan uh, woman haters, but he he does not like it. I don't think it's a bad movie. I think it is uh, very competent, um, even slightly enjoyable. I don't think it's great. Uh, it's nowhere on the same level as the original Ghostbusters or even Ghostbusters 2. But um, I, I, I felt like it was um, neutral in terms of quality. And uh, if no other reason, I enjoyed that it got sexist upset. And so I, I, I don't, I, this thing feels like a bad taste in my mouth, guys. Like Jason Reitman even coming on Twitter and when he announced it and saying like, I don't know if he said this, but he kind of implied it for sure. It's like, okay, let's do it for real now. And it's just kind of, I don't know. I feel like this could ruin the Ghostbusters franchise even more than the 2016 version did. Uh, And this one has a pretty rock solid cast. The returning people are all coming back except for, of course, um, Harold Ramis. Uh, But Ernie Hudson, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver even, Andy Potts as well. Uh, Rick Moranis, no. Uh, I think he's done with movies which good for him for making that choice and sticking to it and not getting sucked back into the hype machine that sony's trying to create um but uh, i don't know jason reitman is i don't know if he's in the right fit for this guys uh they they got gil keenan co-writing it with reitman and he's got a uh, monster house to his credit which actually is a pretty good animated script i have to admit um he also did the poltergeist remake script which uh, i don't know how much talent that takes but it seems like they at least got somebody that knows the genre um, so that's slightly uh, interesting, and you've also got uh, Finn Wolfhard, Carrie Coon, and Paul Rudd, Bokeem Woodbine in the supporting cast, so it's kind of a colorful uh, 
group of people. Um, but uh, Reitman is still just like the sore thumb for me that sticks out here. Uh, he made uh, 15 mil for Tully last year. He had another movie last year that I'd never even heard of about Hugh Jackman. It's like a political drama called The Front Rudder. It only made 3.2 mil. Of course, he's probably most known for uh, three, 231 mil he made for Juno in 2007 and 166 mil for the multi-award nominated Up in the Air in 2009. Uh, both movies that I think are pretty solid, especially Up in the Air. Uh, I actually really liked Tully last year. Uh, I know not a lot of people did, but... Uh, I think he's good at that stuff, but uh, to kind of go into this realm of um, like supernatural comedy and, you know, banked on nostalgia and all that, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be his wheelhouse, guys. It's going to, I think if anything, it'll come up as even more uh, kind of neutral and muted uh, than this 2016, which at least had, um, you know, the improv of uh, uh, its cast at the forefront. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, also, speaking of franchises, uh, No Time to Die, the new James Bond film, officially wrapped uh, production, um, and uh, it's it, it's it it's has a lot go- going for it. Phoebe Waller Bridge uh, coming in to punch up the script is a good sign. Carrie Fukunaga, I think, is one of the best directors working today, both in film and television. But I, you also have Neil Purvis uh, made. I think had the first um, script run through and he did uh, the world is not enough, uh, arguably one of the worst James Bond films. And, uh, but on the other hand, you also have Scott Z Burns taking a pass the script and he wrote contagion and the born ultimatum, both solid scripts. So it, it seems like it's just, it's, that is a lot of script run throughs guys. So that is not necessarily a good sign. Even if you get good people involved, it's gone through so many iterations, especially as like an action convoluted, thriller thing that's not gonna it's not gonna work as well as i would hope i'd imagine but i should say that uh uh, it's on that trajectory that james bond movies have been going where it's like every other james bond movie is decent to actually very good obviously skyfall was the the high point for the daniel craig um uh period of james bond and this being the last one maybe they put some extra oomph into it but uh skyfall made 307 back in 2012 which is huge and uh specter still made 200 mil which was respectable but that movie was just bad just straight bad along with quantum solace which is just such a boring james bond movie um that and that one made 169 mil if i had to guess i don't know i think this one if if they play their cards right marketing and everything i'm hoping we can you know get between at least specter and skyfall maybe 250 for this one um but also uh i don't know how many people really care about uh mgm's james bond figure anymore maybe we've uh lost that um cachet uh especially since it's uh, been a few years uh five it'll have been five years since specter when no time to die finally comes out also the poster got totally dragged on twitter rightfully so like i don't how much effort are they really putting into this i don't know we'll find out last movie we want to talk about uh because it just got announced as one of the first kind of big awards movies for next year not uh the upcoming oscars but the oscars that will be happening in 2021 so coming out late next year will be uh, the trial of chicago 7 um, Aaron Sorkin's uh, second attempt at directing a film after Molly's Game in 2017, which is just bad. Like it was, it's watchable because it's Jessica Chastain, and it was still like Sorkin lightning paced script. Um, but it's just he he, he has. Uh, he has a he has a touch of the ADHD when it comes to movie making and it works for the script but you need somebody to temper him like uh, David Fincher did for the social network um I think he's still chasing that high uh from a few good men back in 92 um and now he's back in the courtroom with this one about the DNC protests that resulted in the arrest of um various uh protesters um who in 1968 that went against the Vietnam War um so I think that I think that you're going to have a, a rough go of this. The cast looks great, though. Jeremy Strong, who I love in Succession um, and actually has been in a lot of movies. Uh, maybe he's just so stuck, stuck at, stood out to me as Kendall in Succession that I haven't noticed that in the past decade. Sasha Baron Cohen, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. None of them have been really been box office earners, um, but Paramount is probably going to be pushing this hard for award season. So I think it'll at least do decent. Anyways, that's 
my time, guys. Thanks for sticking with me for the Wild Line Time Machine. My name's Chris. I'll be back next week uh, if all goes well. And thanks, Dan, again uh, for having me on. This has been the Wild Line Time Machine. And that was a time machine with Chris. Uh, what an awesome segment. Uh, 2004 was such a weird year. The Grudge and Saw. It just Saw specifically because I remember seeing that opening weekend that year. And, you know, it didn't do amazingly well at the box office, right? It didn't make it like $100 million or anything like that. Um, and I remember seeing it, I was like, what the freaking hell is this? Because as a horror movie nerd and fan, like, I, I saw everything, right? And I've been, I've been seeing horror films since, like, the early 90s, mid-90s, whatever. And I, I watch everything because I'm just fascinated by the genre and where it goes. Um, and that one, I just, I never saw that breaking out in the way that it has into this, what is it, like 10 movies, saw movies, and now it's going to reboot it. Um, it, cause when you sat there and watched it, you're basically like, oh, I get it. Like, this is like, you know, like a torture porn type and it's vaguely clever. Uh, but there was nothing really that special about it. I mean, the performances were complete shit and over the top uh, and that was kind of fun, but there was nothing really worthwhile there uh and that saw a series i mean james wands is awesome i love him the conjuring uh insidious those are two the conjuring i think you know i wrote a whole essay about this last year kind of taking stock of the horror film um state of horror films at that time in 2018 uh i i pointed to the conjuring as being a, a massive turning point for the genre where james Wan brought this sort of glossiness to it and it's like back to basics sort of trad horror uh, he did an amazing job. I, I don't think Saw is very good, though. Uh, Insidious is fantastic, much better than Saw. Uh, and then in terms of the new new movies that Chris is talking about, the Ghostbusters thing, uh, that's one of the more bizarre. I rewatched Ghostbusters like a month ago because I wanted to see it. It was on FX. I was like, you know what? Like, let's just rewatch this. This is the, the 2016 version. Uh, let's rewatch this and see if I my, my judgment wasn't clouded by like what was going on back then and like just the online uh shit flinging fight that was i mean it was just it got it got political you have the alt-right involved you have gamergate people involved it just got weird uh and that culture's actually only only gotten worse and if you want evidence of that and i don't like to sort of shit talk other people that do podcasts or whatever videos and stuff and it's weird because i actually like some of their other videos but Midnight's Edge, I think they're called, they do like these kind of informative, like half hour version uh, histories of uh, the Halloween series, which was a really good video. Um, but they've come out these videos. Basically, they've made a little like industry out of attacking Star Wars, like just shitting all over Last Jedi. And you're like, what are you doing with your? And then they have like six videos about how uh, the new Star Wars movie is going to be terrible. It's that ideology, and that's what it is. It is an ideology that is sort of, I don't know what you call it, anti-corporate. It seems pretty clearly sexist to me and misogynistic on some level. Um, those people went after Ghostbusters, uh, and so it was sort of like, and, and I think the fear that Chris has, and I kind of have it too with the new one, is that like, is this new film a, a direct reach out to those people that were so critical of the female centered one. It just feels kind of gross. It gives me like a weird feeling in my stomach, the new one. So I'm kind of on the same page there, but I did go back and rewatch the 2016 Ghostbusters. It's not good. It's a terrible movie. It's a complete mess of a film uh, that doesn't, there's no political sort of statement attached. To it. It's just not good, um, but it's not nearly as bad. And I, and I would probably say the same thing about last Jedi which I didn't really enjoy all that well. But to me, that's not like this sort of like, oh, how dare they? How dare they ruin uh, this series of films that I didn't make and like I'm not involved in whatsoever. The self-righteousness of online critics is just like, or like people on blogs and Reddit and 4chan is just mind-blowing to me. Uh, and now it's, thank God it's gotten off the, the Ghostbusters sort of train uh, and now it's in the star anti Star Wars thing, and I just like I cannot read that stuff or watch it. It's just vile to me. It's just like pure hate, and you're like, what? That's not probably a healthy way of viewing the world, especially art. 
in any event, I digress. Uh, let's talk about what is coming out over the next couple of weeks. This Friday is November 1st, so we have uh, Terminator Dark Fate coming out. We have Motherless Brooklyn. Terminator's tracking in the mid-40s. Um, I don't know how to call this one. I just... It doesn't look that interesting to me. I've never, I have not been interested in a lot of Terminator stuff, despite the fact that Terminator 1 and Terminator 2 are two of my favorite movies probably of all time. Let's say top 200 films of all time. Um, the recent ones of the last, the recent ones over the last like 20 years, there just hasn't been a Terminator movie that's excited me, no matter how many reboots or how many different angles they try to look at. It. The only thing that's really exciting me in that universe has been Sarah Chronic Chronicles, which is uh, tragically canceled by Fox for some unknown reason. Um, but that was awesome. I don't know about this one. It looks okay. Linda Hamilton's back. Uh, you have Mackenzie Davis, who is phenomenal. She's a great actor. Um, we'll see how that one plays. I just, I don't have high hopes that it's going to really break out all that much. Uh, they also have Motherless Brooklyn. Keep your eye on this. Um, it, it has that sort of middle of the road, kind of fast, casual Panera-esque level of filmmaking involved. And that is, it's probably going to be enjoyable. It's probably going to be decent. You're going to have a good time, but it's not going to push you as a viewer anywhere uh, you don't already know or want to go. Uh, and so I think that means it could make a lot of money is what I'm trying to say there. That could play well in the masses. Uh, maybe not Bruce Willis at Norton. This has been a pet project of him for probably like 15 years. I bought it on Hollywood Stock Exchange. I believe it debuted on Hollywood Stock Exchange 20 years ago. Uh, so I've been holding that for at least a decade or something like that. Um, and I made so much money on it. Uh, so Motherless Brooklyn, uh, keep your eye on it. I think it might break out. What does breakout look for that? I you know 25 million maybe. And then it's going to have a really low, um, really long legs, I should say. It's going to have a low drop second, third weekend. So maybe 50 million on up uh, for that one. We'll see. It could be totally wrong about that. Uh, Harriet coming out from Focus Features. That one's kind of, an, a, a, kind of a weird... Uh, in between like awards and sort of mass appeal, it's kind of walking that fine line. I've heard pretty good things about it, but doesn't have a lot of awards hype going for it right now. So if it does well, then those award nominations are going to start flowing in. Right. But if it doesn't, that's kind of going to disappear. Um, That's focus features. Uh, November 8th, we have a big weekend. Dr. Sleep. Last Christmas, Midway, Playing With Fire, all major releases from major studios. Uh, that's a really stacked weekend, basically leading up into the holiday season. Uh, what's going to do well there? I thought Dr. Sleep was going to break out. Uh, I don't know anymore. It's very long. And the early buzz is, hey, hey, this is really good, which translates to like social media when they say that in the first reactions, which is it's probably a train wreck. Uh, unless they say it's the greatest movie ever, then it's probably not very good. Um Last Christmas, I think it's going to do very well. We need a romantic comedy Christmas movie, and that's going to be it. Uh, or you can just watch Hallmark movie all day like I do. Um, Midway is coming out. I don't watch Lionsgate. I hope they did not spend more than $50 million on this movie. It's going to go nowhere. The only people are going to see that are white men over 60, which is a big audience in America, but like that's not going to be able to carry that film. Uh, I don't think that that's going to do very well at all. Playing with Fire... The, it's like that's already a meme the fucking poster is a complete joke looks just awful uh but whatever it's children's film family's got to go see movies that are like safe and fun and that could be one of the choices uh so i think it's gonna do okay i don't think it's gonna break out breakout for that weekend is probably gonna be last christmas i still got my hopes i was re-watching so dr sleeps mike flanagan he did the house on haunting hill uh, is that called House of Honey? Whatever it's called on Netflix. I was rewatching that. That show is so good. He did such a good job with that story and the visuals that, like, you know, I, the ending's terrible. We all know this, but he is a really talented filmmaker. Did a lot of, I think, Six Feet Under work too early in his career. So I, I, I still have high hopes for Dr. Sleep. Um, and then we're into like the 15th Charlie's Angels, Ford vs. Ferrari, The Good Liar. Uh, Ford vs. Rowdy is a grand slam already. I can tell you right now. Charlie's Angels, a little bit of a wild card. Chris thinks it's going to do well. I don't. Uh, 21 Bridges looks interesting from SDX on the 22nd. Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, a Mr. Rogers, um, Tom Hanks film uh, coming on the 22nd. Frozen 2 on the 22nd. I mean, just wipe your calendars out there. I mean, that's going to blow uh, every other film out of the water. Um, 27th Knives Out and Queen and Slim Knives Out, I think is going to do quite well for Lionsgate. And then we're into December. Then it's, you know, then it's Thanksgiving. Then we're talking about holiday season. So pretty interesting fall so far. Um, a lot of weird 
uh, movies doing. I mean, Joker we kind of thought was going to do well, but Adam Stanley doing so well. This is bizarre to me. Down Abbey doing insanely well. Um, we'll see how it plays out here in the next couple of weeks to see if the the new crop can uh, match our expectations uh, or maybe blow them out of the water as well. All right, have a good weekend, guys.